So I would like to begin this video expressing my deepest apologies for the slander I gave to War for Cybertron for the Nintendo DS. I did not know that so many people actually played it and flat out loved the game. My ignorance is unforgivable, but I hope you can find it in your hearts to forgive me. Anyways, welcome back to another iceberg. And this time we're doing the first ever sequel to a previous iceberg I made. I think the range of topics I covered in the first Transformers iceberg was pretty good, but I admit there was some stuff I missed. Also, I called Bitstream and Hotlink Ion Storm and Noah Storm, so uh, sorry about that. Also, a bunch of YouTubers saw my Transformers Iceberg, and that was pretty cool. Uh, I, I was kind of thrown back by that. I didn't think anyone would actually uh, see it, let alone the people that I talked about in the video. But uh, that, that it happened. So anyways, let's begin. Hey, Optimus! How'd you like to hear Pigpen's second Transformers Iceberg? As I believe the Earthlings say, lay it on me, man. In the original Iceberg, I forgot to mention the DS games when I talked about how different the movie tie-in games were from the films they're based on. Alright, so let's begin with the first film's Autobot game. Transformers Autobots is about a dude named Kratobot joining the ranks of the Autobots in the first film. He lands in Las Vegas, and thus from there on, the plot of the film differs, as the Autobots decide to defend a bunch of convoys being attacked by the Decepticons, Ironhide the Starscream battle in the Arctic over a radio tower, Jazz battles and beats Blackout in a fight, thus proving Game Jazz is far more powerful than Movie Jazz. Optimus kills Barricade and Brawl. Ironhide is then sent on bomb defusal duty. Ratchet kills Blackout. And the Autobots only decide to live on Earth because Kratobot's dying words were to call Earth their new home. Also, this game really pushes the whole Optimus and Ventron and Brothers thing. Like, not just like a camaraderie thing, like they were flat out biological brothers. Optimus even claims that Megatron killed his father. As for the Decepticon game, the Decepticon and Kratobot also lands in Vegas, and eventually fights Ratchet and Guitar. Though Ratchet escapes and is never seen again, so it can just be assumed that Ratchet went AWOL. The Decepticons then do a full-on assault on Hoover Dam with Barricade and Blackout attacking it, and then Starscream plans a coup, as he doesn't want to bring Megatron back to life and he wants to leave the Decepticons for himself, so he tries at every chance to stop the Decepticons from finding out that Megatron's alive. Starscream then kills Bumblebee for the Allspark, and then kills both Blackout and Barricade because they realized he was betraying Megatron. Megatron then kills Starscream in Las Vegas, and then eats Kratobot's spark because apparently Kratobot was weak and only served to benefit the strong. Is that cannibalism? In Revenge of the Fallen Autobots, the new Kratobot kills Grindor in Rome with help from the Autobot who looks exactly like Inferno, while Bumblebee and Breakaway, who's also here for some reason, save an oil rig from destruction. Kratobot then kills Sideways in Shanghai, and Demolisher just doesn't exist. By the time of the final battle, Kratobot follows Megatron into a sand pit while Optimus and the Fallen fight, or the two then fight to the death. In Revenge of the Fallen Decepticons, the Decepticon and Kratobot kills Bumblebee in Rome, while Starscream and Grindor blow up an oil rig for some reason. Kratobot then travels to New York City, kills Ironhide, and then interrogates Jetfire for some information. He then gets the Matrix and becomes the Fallen's new right-hand man in Egypt, and then kills Optimus. Yeah, the Revenge of the Fallen games are extremely different to the movie, just like how the console games are just a completely different plot. So the shows in the aligned continuity are Transformers Prime, Red 15, Rescue Bots, and... Oh yeah, Rescue Bots Academy. I forgot that existed. Anyways, there's actually one more aligned continuity show called Transformers Go that's exclusively released in Japan. It's set in an alternate aligned continuity, as the third season of Transformers Prime was never dubbed in Japanese. So the final episode of Season 2 was slightly rewritten to make everyone's fates ambiguous. The show follows this cliffhanger as a team of Autobots land on Earth called the Swordbots. These guys are all original characters and are named... I'm, I'm not pronouncing these, I, I, I can't speak Japanese. Then for the Decepti... Oh right, not Decepticons, the Predacons. As apparently the Decepticons just abandoned Earth after Prime Season 2, despite winning. Their names are... God damn it, I'm not pronouncing these guys either. Except Dragontron, I can do him. The show only lasted 10 episodes and features no returning characters for Prime, except Optimus, who shows up as a train because... I don't know, why not? Together, Optimus and the Swordbots must battle the Predacons for control of the Legend Discs, which are located in different parts of time. Yes, this show does time travel. The show also had its own toy line that did actually bring back more characters for Prime, including Ratchet, who in this universe was captured by the Decepticons, as he was in Season 3 of Prime, but instead of being rescued, was flat out turned into a Decepticon. Fight Super Robot Lifeform Transformers Mystery of Convoy is a game released in 1986 for the Nintendo Famicom, and is well known for just 
being horrible. It's about Ultra Magnus traveling through 10 different stages searching for Optimus Prime, who's gone missing. In the game, Ultra Magnus must battle hordes of Decepticons that are apparently clones of Decepticons from the cartoon. He also battles Megatron, Bruticus, Metasaur, and Trypticon. And if you collected seven secret letters scattered throughout the game, you can then replay the game as Rodimus Prime if you really want to. And no, there are no differences in gameplay. It's just looks. Oh yeah, and you also fight a giant Decepticon logo at some point. There's a lot of theories behind why Jetfire's name was changed to Skyfire in the original cartoon. The most commonly believed theory is that Hasbro didn't have the rights to use the Jetfire toy in the show, though they could still sell the toy. So when Jetfire was added into the show, his design was changed, and since he looked so different from the toy, they just called him Skyfire. This must have been a late decision though, as in the original audio for Fire in the Sky and Fire on the Mountain, Skyfire was referred to as Jetfire. This resulted in the crew re-recording the lines before release. There's been countless mobile games released for Transformers. Some of the more notable ones include... Robots in the Skies was a game based on Grid 15, where you could scan Autobot and Decepticon logos on toys to get temporary access to them in-game. Now, you could unlock them permanently, but this was the game's main gimmick. Age of Extinction the game was an endless runner where players could play as characters from Age of Extinction, like Optimus, Evasion Mode Optimus, Crosshairs, Hound, Drift, Bumblebee, Evasion Bumblebee, Grimlock, Slug, Scorn, Ratchet, Ironhide, Jazz, Hotshot, Sentinel Prime, Red Ironhide, Stealth Bumblebee, Sideswipe, and Smokescreen. Yeah, they just kind of said screw it at some point to begin throwing random characters into the game. Dark of the Moon the video game was a game based on the movie, which requires me now to go and how different it is from the film. In the game, Bumblebee kills Megatron, Sentinel is killed by Optimus without Megatron's help, Sentinel Prime battles the Decepticon drones in the moon for some reason, and Optimus revives Sentinel with a fuel rod, not the Matrix. Which is strange because Sentinel was locked away with the fuel, fuel rods, so he, I guess he could have revived himself. Oh right, and uh, literally none of the Autobots outside of Optimus, Bumblebee, Ironhide, and Sentinel appear. Ironhide's not even playable. Also, all the weapons in the game are from War for Cybertron, which I guess is pretty cool. Transformers G1 Awakening was a turn-based strategy RPG based on episodes from the original G1 cartoon. Though the cast only consists of characters from the first two seasons, Minus, Rewind, Eject, Metroplex, and Trypticon, who are all here for whatever reason. Transformers Legends was a card-based battle game where we collected Transformers characters from G1 through cards. It ran from 2012 to 2015 and had a ton, and I mean a ton of events, where you could get exclusive cards to battle with. Transformers Earth Wars is a Clash of Clans knockoff, let's call it what it is, that's focused on the G1 cast battling out while building bases. Earth Wars might actually hold the record for the most Transformers characters in a video game. I mean, hell, they even got G.I. Joe characters. Transformers Battle Masters was a boxing game that was based on the failed toy line of the same name. Released in 2014, it wasn't really popular and was rather strange looking. I actually remember downloading this in 2014 and thinking it was like a bootleg Transformers game. I'm not sure how long it lasted, but it wasn't very long. Transformers Battle Tactics was a chibi Transformers battle game where you could choose different characters to battle it out with other players. And, okay, no, this game holds the record for the amount of characters. Look, look at this shit. This is insanity. This game only lasted a year, however, and was replaced by Earth Wars, which sucks because I actually think Battle Tactics was pretty fun for a mobile game in 2015. And finally, we have Forged to Fight, which is a Transformers fighting game. Yes, there's a Transformers fighting game out right now that's only for mobile devices. That crosses over characters from the movies, G1, and Beast Wars. That's it. No Unicorn Trilogy, no Animated, not even any characters from the Aligning Continuity or Cyberverse show up. The Transformers Collectors Club was the official fan club for Transformers that lasted from 2005 to 2017. They gave it a free figure every year, six issues a year of the club's magazine, access to the club's forms, and the ability to buy the club's exclusive toys. I'm not entirely sure how popular the service was, but I guess it was successful enough to last 12 years. Another thing to note is that the figures given out in the first five years could actually be combined into the ultra-rare combiner Nexus Maximus, who... Well, he's a prime. I, I guess these five dudes can just casually combine into a god. So I started adding entries to this iceberg back in June of 2021, 
And around that time, there was a rumor that a Transformers film under the working title Beast Alliance was being made. A few months later, and yeah, Rise of the Beasts is announced. In the G1 episode City of Steel, Optimus Prime gets blown up and rebuilt by the Constructicons into Alligatacon. After a brief scuffle with the Autobots, Optimus was then reassembled and Alligatacon was destroyed. The Constructicons here kind of remind me of the Q from All Tomorrows. BotCon was a yearly convention for Transformers fans. It began unofficially in 1994, before finally becoming officially recognized by Hasbro in 2002. And so for 14 years, BotCon was held. Here, you could do a bunch of things, like buy exclusive figures, go to panels hosted by writers and voice actors for Transformers shows, and even buy exclusive BotCon comics. I would love to go to one personally, but I can't. This is because in 2016, Hasbro shut down BotCon, making BotCon 2016 the last one. They did this so that they could start their own HasCon, which combined all of their franchises under one con, like Transformers, My Little Pony, G.I. Joe, Mask, Rom, etc. This didn't do too well, and has led to HasCon 2017 being the only HasCon to ever exist. A second one was planned for 2019, but was cancelled. Now will BotCon return? Maybe. It was announced in 2020, before COVID, that BotCon would return in 2021, and of course that didn't happen because of COVID. BotCon 2023 or 24 could still happen, but apparently there's some drama about the management of BotCon or something, so we'll have to see. Headmasters are a type of Transformer that have their heads modified so they can come off and turn into smaller Transformers, or sometimes organic beings like humans or aliens. That seems very painful. The idea behind it is that the smaller partner gets a new body and the big old Transformer gains an extra perspective on the battlefield, as now he has both his own mind and his partner's minds thinking of tactics and ideas. These guys have appeared in Season 4 of G1, the Marvel G1 comics, the Unicron trilogy, and most prominently in the Japanese exclusive sequel series to G1, The Headmasters, which, as the title suggests, are pretty important to the plot. Headmasters also technically appear in the Bayverse, as Cogman is directly called a Headmaster, despite never using the power. This is left over from a deleted concept where you take control of Nitro Zeus's body during the final fight, and in fact you can actually swap out the heads of the Cogman and Nitro Zeus figures. Target Masters are similar to Headmasters, as it's basically the same idea, but instead of it being the head of a Transformer, it's their gun. Basically, the idea is that either an organic being or a smaller Cybertronian will transform into the gun of a Transformer, in order to take advantage of the, all the things a sentient gun can do, like make its own tactical decisions and target priorities. So if you were alive when Revenge of the Fallen came out, Jesus Christ, I hope you were, because if you weren't, then why the hell are you watching this video? You'll probably remember how Blackout randomly shows up despite dying in the first film. Well, this wasn't actually Blackout though it could have been, according to the writers. Seriously, they had no idea if it was meant to be the same character or not. Anyways, it was revealed in July 2009 that this was in fact Grindor, not Blackout. I'm assuming Blackout was originally meant to be revived alongside Megatron, but they scrapped the scene, so they just said screw it and named him something different. But it must have been a last second choice, because in the files for the Revenge of the Fallen video game, Grindor is listed as Blackout, and in the book Revenge of the Fallen The Movie Universe, Grindor is again called Blackout. Though they look identical, technically Grindor transformed into a different type of Pavlo, a CH-53E Super Stallion, which is apparently a slightly bigger version of the Pavlo seen in the first film. There's a ton of Transformers figures that have been cancelled and left unreleased. I mean, there should be. It's a toy line that started out in 1984, so of course in over 30 years they're gonna, they're gonna have some figures scrapped. These figures could have been scrapped for a number of reasons from cost concerns, to a lack of demand, to just thinking the idea wasn't worth it, bad timing, trademark problems, etc. Many of these figures include Unicron figures, as for obvious reasons, it's a bit difficult to design a toy based around the Planet Eater himself. So in the first iceberg I made, I mentioned how Tarn from the Decepticon Justice Division and the rest of the JDD have never actually appeared in a cartoon, and probably wouldn't because of how, well, you know. Well, technically, Tarn has. Okay, not really, but kinda. While not actually him, the perfect Decepticons featured in the alternate dimension in Transformers Cyberverse are modeled off of Tarn. Micromasters are really small Transformers with fuel-efficient bodies. 
They're usually the same size as a human, and uh, yes, this is an actual panel from the original comic. Hasbro really pushed these guys in the toy market in the later years of the original toy line. Along with these small figures, they sold bases that you could play with as well as MicroMasters that could even combine into forming, well, normal sized Transformers. While not a big thing anymore, MicroMasters are still part of the Transformers toy line to an extent, with the most recent being part of the Wolf for Cybertron trilogy toy line. While originally created as an upgraded form of Megatron in the 1986 film, it's become more and more common for Galvatron to be its own character separate from Megatron. In fact, outside of Age of Extinction and the War for Cybertron Netflix series, every form of Galvatron has been a separate character since Transformers Cybertron. The same goes for Cyclonus and Scourge, and the next entry on the Iceberg. Sound Blaster is an upgraded form of Soundwave introduced in the Headmasters cartoon after Soundwave was killed by Blaster. He's got a black color scheme and has become pretty popular, though the last two decades, like I said, he's stopped becoming Soundwave entirely. Instead, in both of his modern appearances, he's been treated as a clone of Soundwave, usually created by Shockwave for whatever reason. This version of the character even appeared in the War for Cybertron cartoon as a neutral party in the war. Pretenders are transformers that can turn into humans or aliens. To do this, they use pretender shells that can be used as battle armor. These were another line of figures Hasbro heavily promoted in the later years of the original toy line, and were used heavily by both sides of the war, and were a key part of Super God and Master Force. Think of them as the Transformers version of the Eternals, as in this show, they appeared on Earth thousands of years ago and have been living in hiding. In later years, pretenders have kind of stopped being a thing. They still exist in continuities and will pop up sometimes, but they're pretty rare. Their most notable appearance was in Revenge of the Fallen, where the Decepticon Alice turned into an organic human. Though this was a different kind of pretender, as pretenders can't turn into organic humans, so she's like a spinoff to them, I guess. Also, during the hub's promotional ads, Transformers Prime Megatron used pretender technology to turn into a Care Bear. I should also mention before someone points out in the comments, but there were also Mega Pretenders. These could combine their robot form and human form to transform into vehicles. There's also the Ultra Pretenders, which is when a pretender shell can transform into another shell called a vehicle shell, and those two shells and the robots can all fight alongside each other. The Transformers Call of the Future is a Japanese exclusive PlayStation 2 Transformers game about Shockwave accidentally destroying Cybertron. In order to prevent this, the Autobots travel back in time to stop Shockwave from discovering the... Zell Quartz, okay? In doing so, that the team up with Optimus Prime, Wheeljack, etc. Basically, it's what if the Seasons 1 and 2 cast bet the Season 3 and 4 cast. While this game features a wide cast of characters from all four seasons, most aren't actually playable, and are either just enemies or supporting characters. Despite the game having English dialogue and text, it was never ported to the United States because of how much it was panned in Japan. Apparently it has a cult following now, though most people agree it's not that good. I don't really know. I, I just want to play it at some point. It looks really silly. That voice! It must be Megatron! That's right! It's me! Optimus Prime! Yes, it's Megatron. So everyone knows that Megatron originally turned into a gun, and eventually just defaulted into a tank starting with G2. Well, why was this? Well, it's exactly what you're thinking. Over the years, it became less acceptable to release figures based on real guns to kids. So eventually Hasbro just said, screw it, and nowadays mostly makes G1 Megatron turn to tanks. Though, sometimes he does turn into a gun, but when that happens, there will always be an orange chip at the end. Or, sometimes he's just a nerf gun. Over the years, there's been a ton of Flash games available on Hasbro.com about Transformers. Like Flight of the Bumblebee, The Inner John Within, Video Mashup, Autobot Stronghold, Starscream Showdown, Battle for Megatron, RPM Devastator's Demise, Battle for the Matrix, Cyberverse Battle Builder, Primus Unleashed, Victory is Sweet, and Battle Circuit, just to name a few. Transformers The Ride is a theme park attraction at Universal Studios. The ride has you take part in a battle in the Bayverse set between Reg of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon, where Optimus, Sideswipe, Ratchet, Bumblebee, who can talk again, 
Ironhide and Newcomer Evac battle Decepticons like Megatron, Starscream, Bonecrusher, Sideways, Grindor, Ravage, and Devastator. Though I say take part in the fight, I really just mean you kind of just sit in Evac's vehicle form as he drives around the battle and eventually kills Megatron. Obviously, the events in the ride aren't canon because Megatron dies here and, well, half of the Decepticon cast should already be dead. Though yet again, maybe not. Outside the ride, there are people in Optimus Prime and Megatron costumes that will talk to the audience. There's also been two unique figures based on the ride, one based on Evac, and the other one being based on Megatron's unique design in the ride. Though the toy isn't actually accurate to his appearance, it's just a grey repaint of his movie studio's Dark of the Moon figure. If it was accurate, he would have like, the Rudge of the Fallen Claw on one of his arms, but I don't really see how that would work, like, transforming-wise, so I guess it makes sense why they didn't put that in there. I did not come out here to see... Story pages were two-page spreads that would tell a story through artwork with background information thrown around the two pages. These story pages were exclusively released in Japan and featured original stories set after the Japanese exclusive G1 shows, like Transformers the Battle Stars, where Optimus and Megatron were brought back to life to battle once again, and Operation Combination, where everyone decided to become a combiner for some reason. These story pages were also used for Generation 2 and played a key role in introducing Japanese audience to the cast of the 1986 film, as the film wasn't released in Japan at the same time as the United States, so when Season 3 started airing, the film wasn't even out yet. So you're probably thinking there's only one G1 continuity. Well, that's just not true. Not even remotely true. There's the G1 cartoon, the Marvel G1 comics, Japan's G1 continuity, Transformers Classics, Regeneration 1, Wolf for Cybertron Siege trilogy, IDW's Justin 5 continuity, IDW 2019's continuity, Dreamwave's continuity, the Combiner Wars trilogy's continuity, Devastation's continuity, G.I. Joe the Transformers continuity, Transformers Alternity continuity, Transformers Universe continuity, Transformers Cloud continuity, Up Masters and Mayhem continuity, Transformers for the PS2 continuity, and the Beast Within continuity, and just, it, it keeps going on. There's a million of them. Hell, all those Choose Your Own Adventure, like old school Transformers books, all those are in their own continuities too, so... There's just like a million of them. Scheduled to be released this year, a Transformers Jurassic Park crossover figure pack containing a Decepticon who turns into Rexy from Jurassic Park called Tyrannicon Rex, and an Autobot named JP-93 who turns into the Jurassic Park tour truck. They don't really have any lore based on them outside of Tyrannicon wanting to destroy Jurassic Park while JP-93 wants to stop her. I hate to break it to Tyrannicon, but Jurassic Park tends to destroy itself. You're kind of wasting your time here. There's been plenty of Transformer toys released by Burger King and McDonald's over the years to tie in with recent films or cartoons. Are any of these figures worth getting? Well, no, not not really. Seriously, some of these toys are so weird. Like, what is this? This is, this is supposed to be Soundwave. Here's the Fallen, who you can kind of transform? Oh, but that out this Prime figure doesn't look too bad for McDonald's. Oh, but that's just a brick. Is that supposed to be the Jeff Fire combination mode, Bridge of the Fallen? Yeah, there's really no reason to collect these things, but a lot of people do. I tend to just kind of look at them and go, hey, I had those when I was a kid. Do I want to rebuy re them? Nope, I'm fine. I'm good. Transformers World 2005 is a Transformers fan site dedicated to updating Transformers fans on news about the toys, comics, cartoons, and movies. They have a bunch of forums you can talk on. You can look through some of the eBay listings they post, look through the news or the gallery or even look through the site for some toy sightings in your area. It's been where I've been getting my Transformers news for over a decade now, and I highly recommend you use this site as well. It's one of the best ones out there. The Transformers will return after these messages. What you doing? Waiting for Bumblebee to transform. Cool. Sweet. What you guys doing? We're waiting to see if Bumblebee transforms. Cool! Sweet! The Transformers have returned, and right now with a BK Kids Meal featuring a BK Burger Shots 2-pack, you can get your very own Transformers toy, one for Kids Meal. Oh, man! That ain't no Bumblebee, it's just some dude's car. Now at BK. We now return to the Transformers.
Very rarely, there have been times where a black Optimus Prime figure will be released that's supposed to be an evil Optimus Prime, but it's not Nemesis Prime. Some of these include one from 2012 where he willingly joins the Decepticons in order to investigate them, an eHobby exclusive figure from 2006 that's not actually technically evil Optimus, it's just Optimus with the exact Nemesis Prime coloring, and there's also a figure of Optimus Prime from the Titans Return line where he's an Autobot, but for whatever reason featured Decepticon-styled packaging, so I guess he's just thinking about joining them. Also, in the PS2 game I mentioned before, there's a bunch of evil Optimus Prime clones created by the Decepticons, as a reference to the evil Optimus Prime clone from the original cartoon. Jolt's an Autobot from Revenge of the Fallen, and is pretty notable for being barely in the movie. Seriously, if you add up every scene he's in, it's like 20 seconds. He was added very late into the film's production to promote a new car, because of course he was, the live-action Transformers film, of course. Despite this, he does play a decent role in the movie, where he combines Optimus and Jetfire, and that's it. Despite this appearance, Takara and Hasbro were told by the studio that Jolt had been scrapped from the film, so they halted on making toys for him. That is, until they saw his vehicle form appear in trailers, which led to them quickly working on the toys again. Also, Jolt didn't appear in any tie-in comics, books, or video games until roughly seven months after the film's release. But hey, at least he appeared in Rising Storm. The prequel comic to Dark of the Mo Oh, he's dead. Finally, there's two more things to note about him. First, people claim his head appears in Cade's junkyard in The Last Night, but that's clearly not the same head. And second, it took until 2021 to get a movie-accurate figure of Jolt. Poor dude just can't catch a break. Originally, Mirage, or Dino, whatever you want to call him, was going to be killed alongside Wheeljack, or Q, whatever you want to call him during the scene in which they were captured alongside Ratchet and Bumblebee. However, Mirage was spared from the death, and only Wheeljack was killed off. But this was a very last second change, as a test animation for Mirage's death was actually completed. His death would also appear in tie-in material, and a prop of Mirage's destroyed head would still appear in the film in the background by mistake. Q Transformers was a Japanese exclusive Transformers toy line released from 2014 to 2016, the tie-in with the 30th anniversary of the franchise. It's about super deformed Transformers characters that even got an endless runner app to tie in with the toy line, and a parody cartoon series that's literally just half advertising for the game and half the voice actors in character making jokes with the Transformers franchise, which are almost entirely improvised. It seems like a funny show, and it seems like everyone's having a fun time doing it, but I don't speak Japanese, and there's no subtitles, so I have no idea what's going on. There were plans to create a sequel to the cult favorite Transformers game based on Transformers Armada. The sequel began development made by the same developers of the first game, Millborn House, and was planned to be based on the Transformers Cybertron cartoon. However, after a few months of development, Atari forced the studio to work on another project, ultimately canceling the game. Over the decades, in order to keep trademark on certain names, it's become very common for Hasbro to name Transformers characters that are completely unrelated to each other the same name. For example, Blackout and the Bayverse is a completely different character and not an adaptation of Blackout from Generation 1. They just reused the name. The line continuity was Hasbro's attempt at creating one massive Transformers universe that would be connected through games, shows, and comics. Starting out with War for Cybertron, everything seemed great. Until it wasn't. You see, Transformers Prime was also set in the line continuity, and while I love that show, I'm not going to lie to you and say it connects with War and Fall of Cybertron very well. This is because the creators of the show didn't want to be hammered down by the games and pre-established lore. For example, in War for Cybertron, Megatron absorbs Dark Energon for the first time, while in Transformers Prime, he's like, the hell's this when he finds Dark Energon on Earth? There's also just a bunch of other minor problems, like how Cliffjumper is on the arc at the end of Fall of Cybertron, and yet lands on Earth with RC during the flashback episode of Transformers Prime that takes place during the Cybertronian War. Then there's RescueBots, and by extension RescueBots Academy, which were just placed into the line continuity by Hasbro, despite everyone else involved going, this doesn't fit, stop, don't put it in here. Even its tie-in comics and games don't really fit, like the Prime video game. It's supposed to take place during Season 2, but because of the Decepticon cast, it just doesn't fit. Meanwhile, in the Robots in the Sky's tie-in comic, Greta King, who somehow returned to Earth following the events of Transformers Prime, is seen with Starscream's severed arm, despite the Robots in the Sky's episode, Minicom Madness, later on, showing that Starscream after Prime still had both of his limbs. 
And before anyone asks, no, Grimlock and Sideswipe and Grid 15 aren't an issue with this, as they're examples of sharing names. They're not the same characters as the ones in Cybertron games. Overall, the Alliant continuity is really just two continuities. The Cybertron games, which consist of War, Fall, and Half of Rise of the Dark Spark, and the Prime continuity, which consists of Prime, Rescue Bots, Grid 15, and Rescue Bots Academy. In Dark of the Moon, Topspin is the only Autobot in the film not to talk. Well, aside from Bumblebee. He was originally supposed to, as it was announced in an Idaho newspaper that Bill Fagerbach was going to be the voice of a Chevy Impala stock car, obviously meeting Topspin. Ultimately, he never spoke in the film, though he did eventually talk in The Last Night, where he was voiced by Stephen Barr. Despite the Dinobots having a decently sized role in the 1986 film, Snarl, for whatever reason, just doesn't appear in the film outside of three very brief shots. In fact, the script for the film even says four Dinobots, not five Dinobots. Snarl is seen in a Japanese trailer for the film, but it's an alternate take on the scene in which Cup tells the Dinobots some more stories. And for whatever reason, Slug isn't there. To this day, nobody really knows why Snarl was scrapped from the film. Besides what status has become a bit of a mystery in the Bayverse fanbase, Many people believe he's still alive, as we never see him die, and we know that at least Mirage and Topspin made it okay. But, in an Age of Extinction collector's card, it's revealed that Sideswipe was hunted down and killed by Cemetery Wind. Apparently this was based on a deleted scene that would have followed Leadfoot's death, or the Autobots watched footage of Sideswipe's death. So, sorry Sideswipe fans, the dude's probably dead. But hey, to make you guys feel better, let's retcon a random Decepticon KSI drone from Age of Extinction into being Sideswipe. Since, like Ratchet, they probably melted him down to create new drones. Let's see, um... How about that guy? Yeah, that guy can be Sideswipe. As part of the final installment in the War for Cybertron trilogy, the Kingdom toy line introduced a new type of Transformer that I'm sure will never appear again. These are called Fossilizers who are Maximals and Predacons that turn into the skeletons of dinosaurs, and can also break apart and attach themselves to Autobots and Decepticons to become weapons and armor. I'm going to be honest with you, these things are an anomaly to me. Like, in-universe, how did they live? Can all Cybertronians turn into bones? Why would they want to tear themselves apart to be put on someone else? Do they still feel pain when they're part of somebody? How do they walk? Are they like skeletons in fantasy movies, where it's just kind of like magic, or... Are they just like robots infused with bone? Known fossilizers include Paleotrex, Rachnonite, Wingfinger, Trinicus, Skelivore, and Transmutate from Beast Wars, who is now a fossilizer because... I'm sorry. Oh, and there's also Dracodon and Vertebrake, who are both fossilizers, but don't have the ability to break apart. So technically, like officially, they're not called fossilizers, but look at them, they're fossilizers, come on. Trans Theories is a Transformers YouTuber who focuses on fixing plot holes in the first five live-action Transformers films. The amount of work this dude puts into these videos in order to fix, say, where was Jolt during Vigil of the Fallen and Dark of the Moon, or why was there an extra Guardian Knight during The Last Night, or why was there a train moving in the background in Dark of the Moon? It's extremely impressive. I'm a huge fan of his channel, and it was going to actually put him in the last iceberg, but had to remove him last second because at the time, a two hour long iceberg was something I wasn't ready for. Oh, oh, that's changed. Here's some of my favorite videos from him. Go check him out. In G1's third season opening five part episode, Five Faces of Darkness, Bloodswing temporarily allies of the Autobots after he finds out that the Quintesson were manipulating Galvatron. He tried to tell Galvatron, but he refused to believe him, which led to him allying with the Autobots to stop the Quintessons. Thankfully for them, the Autobots and Blitzwing were able to stop the Quintessons, but in the process, Galvatron accused Blitzwing of betraying the Decepticons and banished him from the Decepticons forever. Rodimus Prime would then offer Blitzwing a place in the Autobots, to which he would respond with, I'll think about it. And for the rest of the show, he just didn't appear. But that wasn't always the plan. Originally, Blitzwing was going to return in the episode Starscream's Ghost, or he'd be friendly with the Autobots. However, this episode was rewritten during production to feature the new triple changer, Octane. They don't really explain why Octane's friendly with the Autobots, he just kind of is. It's a shame, really. Seeing Blitzwing, a decently long-running villain, turning into a hero would have been a cool development for the show. But then in Headmasters, he's back to being on the Decepticon side, so I guess in the uh, Japanese continuity, Galvatron just kind of get over it. In the Beast Wars episode Transmutate, it's revealed by Rat Trap that my wife RC is his great aunt. 
This was in reference to how Beast Wars voice director and Transmutate's voice actress Susan Blue also voiced RC in G1. As for an in-universe explanation, I don't know, because Cybertronians don't have kids like humans do, so I don't really know how this is possible. It's even mentioned in the Transformers Legends manga that Rat Trap in this continuity bathed with RC while he was still growing up. Regardless of how it's possible they're related, it's clear the two have an interesting relationship. The Decepticon Short Round, yes that's his name, is really into collecting figures, according to his online CyberKey code bio. And in that bio, it's revealed that his two most prized possessions are Generation 2 figures of Defensor and Menasaur, which were never released, mind you. So I guess in the Unicron Trilogy continuity, humanity was like, yeah, let's turn these dudes that landed on our planet and brought their war here, uh, let's turn them into action figures, ones that are extremely 90s. It's become a bit of a running joke in the Transformers fanbase that Clipjumper, like Optimus Prime, dies all the time. But I don't really think that's true. Like, sure, he dies in Transformers Prime. Twice. IDW's original continuity. War for Cybertron Siege and Bumblebee. But that's really it? I don't know where this joke came from, but I know it's not true. Transformers vs. The Terminator is a four-issue crossover miniseries that ran from March 2020 to September 2020. It is about... what else? The Autobots and Sarah Connor battling the Decepticons and the Terminator. In the year 2029, the Decepticons have destroyed Earth, and to make sure that they don't do that to ensure their own dominance, Skynet sends the Terminator back to 1984 to kill all Cybertronians. It's a pretty fun crossover that has Terminator Megatron in it, so if that sounds interesting to you, go check it out. Sadly, there weren't any figures made to promote this series, despite Terminator Megatron being right there. Botshots was a toy line in the early 2010s about chibi versions of G1, Unicron Trilogy, Bayverse, and Transformers Prime characters. The gimmick with this toy line was that each figure was actually part of a game that was basically rock, paper, scissors. You'd transform the figures into vehicle form and then send the toys ramming into each other. When the figures transformed, it would reveal one of three options. Blaster, Fist, and Sword. There was even a track set release for this. Hector Ramirez is an extremely minor character that appears in the G1 episode, Prime Target. He wouldn't be very notable if he didn't also make appearances in G.I. Joe, in Humanoids, and Gem. So while we know G.I. Joe and G1 shared a universe, I guess Gem and the Inhumanoids do too. He was created as a parody of Geraldo Rivera, a right-wing tabloid writer. Bitch Wars was the code name for a scrapped Beast Wars episode that would have been about a quote-unquote ladies' night out, with Arrow Razor and Black Arachnia leaving the Maximals and Predacons to create a third faction. The episode was scrapped because they couldn't find the right angle to approach the subject from. They also named an episode of Beast Wars, Bitch Wars, so that might have had something to do with it. MGO316 is a Transformers YouTuber who does figure reviews and transformation guides. The latter of which being very useful to me, as I'm kind of an idiot. And even with instructions, my dumbass can't seem to figure out half the Transformer figures I own. He's a great content creator and I highly recommend checking out his reviews, as he posts them pretty frequently. Here's some of my favorite videos from him. Transformers Back to the Future is a four-issue miniseries that crosses over the two 80s franchises. It was released from October 2020 to June 2021. The comic takes place right after the first film, in which Martin McFly returns to 1985, but becomes a target for the Decepticons who plot to take the time machine and conquer time itself. It's a pretty fun crossover that actually had a figure made to promote the story. Gigawatt, the DeLorean time machine. Yeah, they turned the DeLorean into a Transformer. Oh, and the clock tower from the first film, who is now named Watchtower. Yeah, an entire building just comes to life. Oh, and Flame War also makes an appearance. She's a relatively newer Transformers character, so I, I thought it was worth mentioning that she appears in this non-canon crossover. Overall, it's a fun time, and I recommend it. I mean, God knows we're not getting more Back to the Future content. Thankfully, thankfully. I don't want to live in a world where we have a Back to the Future remake or a Back to the Future 4. Because Hasbro imported Transformers from multiple different toy lines, there were some problems with turning them all into sentient robots. Take, for instance, Ironhide and Ratchet, as their original figures were originally mechs piloted by humans in their original toy line, so neither of them had a head. In order to fix this, Hasbro released stickers to be placed in the driver's seats, which kinda looked like a face. It didn't really help. Thankfully, their designs were completely remade for the cartoon. 
though you can actually still find their original models in the very first issue of the Marvel comic, because Marvel didn't get the heads up in time that their designs would be changed. In The Last Night, it's mentioned by Anthony Hopkins. I know his character has a name, but let's be honest, neither you or I care. That he's the last of the Witwickens, which means that Sam Witwicky is dead. I mean, it makes sense. If, if Cemetery Wind was hunting Autobots, they'd go after Bumblebee, and who's usually chilling out with him? Sam. So I guess both Sam and Carly are dead. At least my wife, Michaela Baines, is still alive. Probably. Maybe. She probably silenced because she knew too much, so scratch that, she's probably dead too. Along with Sam's parents, actually, that means that they're dead too. And by extension, probably their dog. Oh, well, most of the characters in the first three films are dead. I really have no idea how I forgot to put these guys in the last iceberg, but here we go. Takara, or I guess Takara Tommy now, is a Japanese toy company that produces the Transformers figures in Japan, and pretty much the entire franchise over there. They're also the guys and girls responsible for most of the Transformers figures over the years. As in, like, the designs for them. And that's really all I have to say about them. Uh, thankfully, over the years, more and more Transformers fans have become aware that Hasbro aren't the only ones responsible for your favorite Transformers robot toy franchise. As we all know, Fox Kids is known for its... interesting censorship and dubs. And it's no different with Transformers. Aside from the 9-11 imagery in Rid-01 that I mentioned last iceberg, Fox Kids also censored a decent amount of Beast Wars, like a scene of Tarantulas being impaled, Cheetor being brutally beaten, Tarantulas again being set on fire, Rhinox grabbing Dinobot by the throat, and Silverbolt being headbutted. Damn, I, I guess headbutting is too extreme for kids. In 2011, a pitch was being created that had crossed over the worlds of DC and Transformers, with ideas like Wonder Woman's Invisible Jet and Batman's Batwing being Transformers. Optimus Prime being a Green Lantern, and Aquaman battling the Seacons. It seemed like it was going to happen, but then in the middle of 2011, DC announced the New 52, which meant that DC wasn't really interested in doing crossovers at the moment, since they were literally rebooting their entire universe. So because of the New 52, we never got to see this crossover happen. TFI Creations is a Transformers YouTube channel that makes stop-motion Transformer films and shows. Their main show is Transformers Interstellar, which has gone on for quite some time now. They've also made prequel short films to the Bayverse and Bumblebee. Is Bumblebee canon to the Bayverse? Asper keeps insisting it is. Anyways, go check them out. Their stuff is pretty good. Here's some of my favorite of their shorts that aren't part of any major series. Obviously check out Interstellar. The Survivors were a third party in the Marvel UK Transformers comic, where the Autobot Wrecker unit and the Decepticon Mayhem Attack Squad abandoned their factions after feeling abandoned and ignored by their allies. And so the remains of the two Special Forces teams combined to form the Survivors, which didn't really have a leader because both Sprigger and Carnivac consider themselves the leaders, but neither would take orders from each other. Honestly, them all abandoning their factions is a bit weird and paranoid, because there's like no reason why the Decepticons in the group couldn't have just went to Earth to regroup the rest of them. Meanwhile, the Autobots literally couldn't be picked up because of a massive attack that recently happened that left the Autobots crippled, so they couldn't really look for survivors, let alone launch a ship. The faction would work together for the remainder of the comic run, though not a single member of the faction outside of Skids, very briefly, would ever appear in the Marvel US comic. They'd even appear in Earth Force, which is just a continuity headache. The Transformers will return after these messages. Look alive, gang! Lunchables Chicken Dunks are here to transform lunchtime! Every specially locked box has a pocket Transformers toy inside! You can collect all six Autobots and Decepticons, only from Lunchables! Cool! And look! You can see Transformers in theaters July 4th, rated PG-13! You can transform lunchtime into fun time with Lunchables Chicken Dunks! It's more than lunch! It's Lunchables! to the Transformers. World of Warships is a free-to-play online game where you battle each other using warships from the Second World War. For whatever reason, they crossed over with the Transformers in 2020 with themed skins for the warships. You could even recruit Optimus Prime, Megatron, Soundwave, Bumblebee, Hot Rod, Grimlock, and Rumble of all characters as fleet commanders. 
Honestly, you'd think a World of Warships crossover would have, like, Tidal Wave or Broadside as the actual warships. But I guess they're just too obscure for the general public to care about. When Hasbro brought Visionaries into the Hasbro universe, they thought the best way to advertise this would be through a crossover with the Transformers. And I mean they're probably right. I know I hadn't heard of Visionaries before the crossover in 2018. What exactly is Visionaries? Well, it's a cartoon that lasted 13 episodes back in 1987, about Space Knights or something. Yeah, it's not really the biggest franchise to cross over Transformers. In fact, the franchise has been pretty much dormant since 1987. I'll be honest, I have no idea whether or not this crossover is good or not. I skipped over it when I was reading through IDW. Even though it's technically one of the final arcs of the series, I just... It just didn't seem interesting to me. I actually had no idea about this crossover until a commenter pointed it out to me. But in 2019, a crossover manga between Transformers and Mazinger Z was released. Mazinger Z being an anime and a manga franchise that ran for 92 episodes from 1972 to 1974. About a supergiant robot doing some fighting. You know, the usual. Due to its popularity, we got a bunch of sequel shows, films, and spin-offs. And this crossover is one of them. Though this crossover is more than likely made to tie in with the Mazinger Z film released in 2018, a year prior. I haven't read this myself, but it seems to have gotten a positive reception. Because Hasbro also owns the Nerf toy line, they sometimes feel it's necessary to release Transformers Nerf guns. As a kid, I didn't really get this because when I wanted to play with Transformers, I wanted Transformers, not a gun attached to Optimus Prime's hand that you can put on your hand. Oh, and Titan Magazine also released a ton of toy guns, or blasters, with their magazines in order to get people to buy them. Transformers GT Mission GTR is a 2013 Japanese exclusive toy line that was a cross promotion with the Super GT Racing Championship, a pretty popular racing championship in Japan. The cross promotion had four figures that each came with an anime girl. Okay. There's also lore to this toy line as each figure came with a short story, and there was even a one-shot manga released. Like how the Transformers and GT sisters, as the anime girls are called, took part in a photo shoot to promote coexistence. Some of the girls threatened to cry in order to make their Transformer partner sad, the GT sisters can merge with Fortress Maximus, and the GT sisters defeated Unicron with the help of the Transformers. There's also Safety Prime, who makes sure everyone follows the rules and can apparently see all. This is one of the best microcontinuities out there, and you can't convince me otherwise. In 1993, an LCD handheld game made by the infamous toy company Tiger Electronics was released, based on the Generation 2 toy line. In this video game, you play as Optimus Prime battling Decepticons, and can even call for help and temporarily summon some Autobots to help you. Oh, and there's also no music in the game, at all, and Megatron's also not here. Starscream's the main antagonist. The game is obviously, well, just look at it. But for whatever reason, in 2020, it was re-released. I guess for nostalgia? I have no idea, but maybe people actually like it? I don't know. In Dark of the Moon, there's two Decepticons that are just background characters. These are GarageBot and Loader, though the latter technically had some plot relevance as he's the one that brought the Pillars to Chicago, though he actually doesn't transform in the movie. They'd be completely whatever minor background characters, but they both actually appear in Age of Extinction as playing cards. You remember that scene in the movie where Edinger is looking at his Transformers hit list, which is just playing cards for whatever reason? Why they do that? I, I mean, I guess it makes them look more like villains, but I mean, they're hunting down the Autobots, so it's kind of obvious they're villains. We just saw Lockdown fucking annihilate rat whatever. Point being is, you can actually barely see Loader on one of the cards. And you can't really see Garage Bots. But in 2019, there was a prop auction for the Bavers. And one of those props was the playing cards. Which one of them revealed Garage Bots. And yes, it's spelled Garage Bot, not Garbage Bot. I know, somebody made an oopsie. And according to the card, Garage Bot is still alive while Loader was killed. Side note, these cards also reveal that Mirage is still alive, and that he's called Mirage. A Tactics was a game created by Hasbro that crossed over Marvel Comics, Transformers, and Star Wars. The game had you take a bunch of characters from each franchise and battle it out by taking turns, making moves, and attacking with hit points. They made a whole bunch of these things back in the day, but when the line went on an indefinite hiatus, aka cancelled, in 2007, 
An entire wave of these figures was scrapped. These figures would have included G1 and movie versions of the characters, as the first wave was just based on Transformers Energon and Cybertron. Except for four figures, G1 Optimus, Megatron, Armada Skywarp, and Energon Landquake were the only Series 2 figures to ever be released, though they were only sold for a little bit of time in the United States, and are very rare. Transformers Beginnings is a motion comic adaptation of the IDW movie prequel comic, Prime Directive. It features some of the voice actors from the movie and voice actors from G1, and was released exclusively at Walmart as a bonus DVD with the 2007 film. Though I guess I shouldn't call it a motion comic, as it's just panels being read over that will occasionally zoom in for effect, and sometimes I'll throw in a stock like fire effect or something. The back cover of the DVD also flat out lies and says that Peter Cullen narrates the movie, but in reality, Optimus only has a few lines, while Mark Ryan is the narration. Side note, Optimus also says that none of our lives matter, which is kind of a screwed up thing for Optimus to say. When Transformers came to the States, Sideswipe and Sunstreaker were just some of the many characters introduced. But these two had some trouble, as their characters and personalities were created before their figures were shipped. You see, originally, Sideswipe was Sunstreaker's toy, and Sunstreaker was Sideswipe's toy. Hasbro decided to swap the colors of the toys, so the characters swapped as well, which led to some issues with the cartoon, as the cartoon gave Sideswipe the abilities of Sunstreaker's toy, like having a jetpack or being able to turn his hands into pilot drivers. So every single version of Warpath features his iconic tank cannon in the middle of his chest, that he can use to fire off shots at the Subcons. That is, all but one. In Transformers Animated, his tank cannon was changed to a radar dish, this is because in the animated continuity, Autobots don't transform into weapons of war, so instead of turning into a tank, he transformed into a radar station, though in-universe he modified his radar dish to be able to fire sonic pulse rounds. While Transformers for the PS2 is a cult classic, not many people know that the game was re-released as Transformers Director's Cut, which included a bonus DVD that contained a 20-minute making-of documentary. The reason people don't really know about this is because this version of the game was only released in the UK. Thankfully, people have leaked it online so everyone can view it. I'll link it in the description below. It's actually a pretty interesting watch. Jam is a really strange meme in the Transformers fanbase. In 2002, Hotshot's mini comic that came with his figure was released and was instantly mocked for being bad. It wasn't really the author's fault, however, as the comic was trilingual, which forced the author to fit three different languages worth of dialogue into really tiny speech bubbles. In order to make fun of the comic, British Transformer fan Yartek rewrote the entire comic with crude humor, with one notable joke being Hotshot declaring his love for Jam. This has become such a popular joke with Transformers fans that the 2008 Universe Hotshot figure had Jam as his alt mode's license plate, and in an episode of RescueBots Academy of all things, there's an episode in which Hotshot declares his love for Jam after falling into a mysterious blue substance. While Sixshot didn't really get much attention in the West, with his only big role being in the final episode of the fourth season of G1, in the Japanese version of G1, he received a much larger role in the franchise, becoming one of the main antagonists of the Headmasters. Though by the end of it, Sixshot would abandon the Decepticon cause after a change of heart. Years later, in Transformers Victory, the character Great Shot would appear based on the toy of the same name which was just a retool of Six Shot. He was an Autobot with a mysterious past, and so a lot of fans at the time speculated that Great Shot was actually Six Shot. This would later be retconned into being true in Great Shot's Legends tie-in comic in 2018, in which it was revealed that Star Saber gave him a new Transtector, which allowed Six Shot to get a new identity and fake his death in order to avoid the wrath of the Six Clan, a clan of Six Changer ninjas. Don't ask, it's 1980s Transformers. Just roll with it. Beast Wars received two different video games that have kind of become obscure. First, there's Beast Wars Transformers, a third-person shooter released in the original PlayStation and PC. It had two different campaigns like most Transformers games, and it's also apparently really bad. While it had a large roster of playable characters, Waspinator isn't one of them, despite a model for him being made. Then there's Beast Wars Transmetals, released for the original PlayStation, which was a fighting game, taking place during the second season of the show, that had most of the cast playable, Except Rhinox and Waspinator for some reason. You'd think they would be, but I guess not. ConstructBots is a line of building block toys like Lego, or another building block franchise, Creo, which I talked about in the last iceberg. 
These construct bots are highly poseable and customizable, as you can swap pieces from different sets. And unlike Creo, you can actually transform these characters from robot mode to vehicle form without disassembling them. These figures were released from 2013 to late 2014 before being discontinued. They had figures for G1, Transformers Prime, and Age of Extinction, though the latter two lines had a very big fault. These designs used rubberized ball joint tips, which are prone to dry rot after a few years. Just like any other film, Transformers had a lot of concept art made for it, and in that concept art were a lot of original designs for the characters. And a lot of them, in fact I'd say most of them, look pretty different from what they ended up looking like in the films. Starting out with the Autobots, we have Optimus Prime, who wasn't that different from what we got. The most notable things are his wrist-mounted gun and his head looking kind of weird. Also, one of his elbows looks mangled up. Optimus' upgraded form image of the Fallen looked... Well... Wow. He has giant shoulders, a giant blaster, and a drill? Or something? On one of his arms? And I think shoulder turrets? What are those? Bumblebee had this, like, really sad-looking Cosmos-like vehicle form head thing. Like, his eyes look really sad. Also, his arms look like they bend backwards. You know, that's probably why he's sad. Originally, RC was going to be in the 2007 film, and her design looked terrible. I'm just going to be honest here. I think it looks horrible. I really, really don't like it. Thankfully, she got redesigned for Revenge of the Fallen, though I don't really like that design either. Ratchet has original color scheme, though with more red than white, and looked... Well, it looked like this, that's all I can really say. Originally, Drift's design had a company logo on him, like the Wreckers from Dark of the Moon. He also has a color scheme similar to his Rid 15 design, which probably served as inspiration for that incarnation of the character. Also, it seems his swords emerged from his hands, like Optimus' Energon swords from the first four films. For some reason, Leadfoot, Roadbuster, and Topspin all had concept art for their protoform modes, which I guess means that we were originally going to see them land on Earth in the film, or like Megatron in the first two films, refused to get Earth modes. They're not that different from their actual forms, though Leadfoot has a dog, and Roadbuster was originally a version of Warpath. Daytrader's original design originally had his head look like an alien Steve Buscemi. I hate it. This is disgusting. Sideswipe was originally really skinny, and a single, small, dagger-like weapon. He also has G1 color scheme. For the Decepticons, Megatron looked a lot different from the design we got. He had looked like his G1 self for starters, and you could tell that by the tread legs, he turned into some kind of tank. Also, he looked like he had some kind of shield on his arm. The Fallen's brothers had several pieces of concept art made for them, where they're either bulkier or skinnier. I assume the Fallen would have also looked like this, since all the primes in the film share the same model. One of Soundwave's many designs for the film was this, where he was this kind of like short and stubby dude with really long arms. Originally, Devastator had a vehicle form, which I think would be the first combiner with a vehicle form. I have no idea how this vehicle form is supposed to work, though. Like, he's got treads, wheels, and feet. Does he roll or walk? Originally, Blackout was named Devastator, because of course he was. Every Decepticon in the 2007 film was him at some point. Anyways, he had a giant cannon on his back, which forced him to be hunched over constantly. Sentinel Prime was a lot greener, originally, and had a similar-looking robot form to what we end up seeing in the film. His head was pretty different, though. We actually do see this color scheme, or a color scheme like it, in the original Dark of the Moon teaser trailer. Originally, Lockdown's giant sniper rifle was just going to be, well, a big sniper rifle, and not an alternate mode for his head. Galvatron looked more like Optimus Prime, which makes sense considering the fact that in-universe, Galvatron was meant to look like him. He even had those blasters Optimus had in the first two films. Now let's look at the concept art for characters that were going to appear, but didn't end up appearing in the films. Originally, a character named Galvatron was going to appear in Dark of the Moon. It's unknown if this was meant to be an upgrade of Megatron, but he was called Galvatron in the concept art, so it's possible. Regardless, he has Ultra Madness shoulders, which is pretty funny. Something I didn't learn about until recently was that the parts of Cybertron that the TRF and the Autobots land on the last night during the final battle were originally going to have wildlife, including a giant Cybertronian snake on it. This is also where the Optimus Primal concept art comes from. In The Last Night, Dreadbot and Berserker are basically just copies of Crowbar and Crankcase from Dark of the Moon. Well, apparently there was going to be another one based on Hatchet to complete the Dreads 2.0 group. While showing up in the second film, Hightower never actually transforms. 
He's got a weird robot mode with T-Rex-like arms and a crane claw that looks useless as a weapon. Despite not transforming in the film, there actually has been several figures of him released. Like Hightower, Overload technically appears in the film, but never transforms. In his concept art, he's got this crab spider-like mode with four arms and four legs. Just like Hightower, he's also gotten a couple figures of him made. In Revenge of the Fallen, there was originally going to be a giant aircraft carrier Decepticon that presumably would have showed up during the Decepticon landing sequence. The concept art calls it the Fallen, but I have no idea if this was actually meant to be the Fallen or not. Maybe it was going to be Tidal Wave? That Model T Seeker briefly shown in Revenge of the Fallen was going to appear in the film originally, with concept art of him being made. I actually really like this design. It gives me War of the World vibes, like humanity used the alien technology left behind by the tripods to create this or something. And finally, the HMS Alliance in The Last Night, while again appearing in the film, never actually transformed. Though a robot form of her was actually created, where she's got a scuba gear-like design. In Chengdu, China, a 3D projected display promoting the Transformers War for Cybertron series was put up around August 2021 to promote the final installments of the trilogy and to pay tribute to the 25th anniversary of Beast Wars. Sean Long, formerly Sean X Long, is a YouTube channel that used to review Transformers figures, along with other toys, though his Transformers stuff seemed to be the most popular. He did this for a long time, but I watched a lot of his stuff from 2008 to 2011, and it seems most of his views came from that era. I haven't watched his stuff in a decade, but here's some of his videos I remember watching to give you an idea of the kind of content he made back in the day. Fan mode is a term for an unofficial alternate mode created by fans, for example, Short Round from Transformers Cybertron, honestly him getting too mentioned into this video is probably the most anyone's talked about him in over a decade, has a fan mode of a toilet. They even made a toilet mode for Sea Spray in the Titans Return toy line, though I couldn't find a photo of it, just take my word on it. Titans Return Six Shot also has some fan modes, including a city and a boat. There's also Revenge of the Fallen Mind Wipe and Sky Stalker that can normally combine in vehicle mode, but fans have been able to create a fan mode where they combine their robot modes. There's also canon fan modes that are used in cartoons and comics. For example, in Beast Wars 2, Apache uses a fan mode very briefly, while in Transformers Cybertron, Galvatron has a death cannon mode. And most famously, in Car Robots, which is what Robots in the Sky 2001 is called in Japan, Devil Gigatron has a Devil Gigatron Ostrich fan mode, which was created by a Takara employee and was canonized in a Legends comic. In Beast Wars, Era Razor was only female because of Beast Wars story editors Bob Forward and Larry Detelio's insistence as the original figure wasn't developed with any specific gender in mind and they wanted a larger female presence in the show. This did not happen in the Japanese dub. In the dub, Era Razor was made a male, which means yes, Tigatron and Era Razor became a gay couple. Originally they were able to rewrite their flirting, but eventually they couldn't get around it anymore and eventually just said screw it and allowed them to be a couple. Later down the line in the Transformers Legends manga, they did make jokes with a gender switch up between the two versions by portraying Arrow Razor as a femboy. Some people hate this. I simply just do not care. Transformers Milk Caramel is a brand of candy produced in the late 80s. This candy would include two things. The first being chocolate covered caramel candies, obviously, and the other being small rubber models of Transformer characters like Stars, Ray, Atlas Prime, Megatron, Soundwave, etc. They did this for the original G1 cartoon, Headmasters, and even Super God Master Force, which means there were a ton of these to collect. 213 to be exact. There was a video game being made for the Super Nintendo by Argonaut Software based on Generation 2. Nothing, and I mean nothing, is known about this cancel game, outside of people claiming it was turned into the 1994 game Vortex. Though, in 2015, it was finally confirmed that this was 100% not true. There's far too many original designs for me to discuss here, so I'll just show off some examples. You see, with Generation 1, a good chunk of the characters were completely redesigned for the cartoon, as their original designs for their original box art, and some of these wouldn't translate well to the cartoon. Though there were some exceptions to this rule, like a good chunk of the 1986 film's cast of characters who were mostly designed for the movie with the idea that the toy would come later. This is very different from how Transformers figures were made back in the day. But even then, their original designs weren't always used, as Scourge, for example, was heavily redesigned for the cartoon, with his original art being used for box art instead. 
For unknown reasons, in the French dub of the 1986 film, Starscream was depicted as a woman, as Starscream has a female voice, and Megatron even refers to Starscream as a female gender-specific insult. This is strange because in the French dub of the original cartoon, Starscream was still a guy. So why they changed it? I have no idea. Diaclone was one of the first toy lines to be used by Hasbro to create the Transformers brand. The toy line was introduced in 1980 and mostly focused on sci-fi, robots, and mecha. Though in 1982, they started releasing Diaclone figures that could transform into alternate modes based on modern day vehicles. This is what sparked an interest in Hasbro, as some Hasbro representatives were impressed by the line of toys at the Tokyo Toy Show in 1983. When Transformers was deemed an international hit, Diaclone was quietly scrapped in 1985 in favor of Transformers being imported to Japan. This is despite a small attempt earlier in the 80s to import Diaclone itself to the United States. These attempts, however, became extremely obscure. However, in 2016, Diaclone was revived, and with it, new figures in the Diaclone line. Sometimes Transformers characters have their names changed due to the name not being available, because Hazard doesn't currently own the rights to the name, or simply lost the rights to the original name. The most famous example of this is Reflector, who is now known as Refractor in pretty much every continuity he shows up in nowadays. Cinder Twin also used to have this problem, as for a little while he had to go under the name Twin Strike, though in 2018 Hasbro got the rights back to Cinder Twin's name. Sometimes characters will acquire additions to their names on their packaging due to the names being so common, like Hot Rod and Hound, who are oftentimes released as Autobot Hot Rod and Autobot Hound. Though the former is also often just called Rodimus, in order to combat the whole Hot Rod being a common phrase thing. Despite dying in the 2007 film, a toy of Jazz called the AllSpark Enhanced Jazz was released exclusively in Target. The bio for the figure mentions how he was badly damaged in the final battle, and that he was almost destroyed, not completely. Jazz is brought back to life due to the power of the AllSpark, and he's apparently more powerful than ever. This figure might have been inspiration for Jazz's revival in the alternate universe comics released by Titan Magazine that I talked about in the last iceberg. Does this mean that Jazz survived the 2007 film and was killed off in between the first and second film? No, absolutely not. It's a non it's a, it's a toy bio. Come on. It's not canon. Despite being created for the Generation 1 toy line, Whirl never made an appearance in the cartoon, though he did make an appearance in the anime Special Armored Battalion Dorvac. How is this possible? Well, Whirl was originally part of the toy line the anime was based on, so he appeared in the anime as a mecha that could turn into a helicopter called the Avalon Gazette. With Dreamwave closing its doors, as I talked about in the last iceberg, it left a ton of Transformers comics unreleased. Like six issues of the Energon comic, three issues of Age of Wrath, their entire Beast Wars comic that they were planning, along with their Energon More Than Meets the Eye comic. The former would have been a direct sequel to the cartoon and filled in the gaps between that show and Beast Machines. Also, there's Transformers Evolutions, which would have been an anthology series with each volume being its own story and its own continuity. The only arc ever completed was Hearts of Steel, which we talked about in the last iceberg, with the rest of the franchise being cancelled. Though there were ideas of potential future installments released to the public, where the Transformers land on Earth during the Holy Roman Empire and the Renaissance. In the 1989 issue of the Marvel comic Dark Star, Starscream becomes supercharged with the power of the Underbase at the very end of the Underbase saga, turning him into a cosmically powered menace, arguably the most powerful character of the entire franchise, aside from maybe Unicron and Primus. The Autobots and the Decepticons realize what a threat he is and team up to defeat him. This goes extremely poorly as the largest death count of any Transformers media happens. In this single issue, Starscream kills Hound, Blue Streak, Mirage, Hoist, Brawn, Gears, Bumblebee, Jazz, Jetfire, Blaster, Thundercracker, Skywarp, Grimlock, Slug, Snarl, Sludge, Swoop, Chase, Freeway, Rollbar, Searchlight, Wide Load, Air Raid, Silverbolt, Fireflight, Skydive, Slingshot, Snaptrap, Naughty Later, Overbite, Sea Wing, Scaler, Tentacle, Laserbeak, Buzzsaw, Octane, Astrotrain, Blitzwing, Soundwave, Omega Supreme, Ratbat, Beachcomber, Prowl, First Aid, Sunstreaker, Ironhide, Wheeljack, Trax, Scattershot, Strafe, Lightspeed, Afterburner, Nose Code, Razor Claw, Dive Bomb, Headstrong, Rampage, Tantrum, Hunger, Ripper Snapper, Blot, Sinner Twin, Cutthroat, Power Glide, and Perceptor. Holy shit, that's a lot of people. 
Sorry I had to list out all the names, if that was annoying to you, but I figured that was the only way to get it across how many people this dude killed in one issue. Oh, and to top it all off, the power ends up being too much for Starscream, and he dies too. A tribute to this comic was featured as a major plot point in Transformers Cyberverse decades later, when Starscream becomes all-powerful after combining with the Allspark, though in this, he fails to actually kill anyone. In the 80s, in order to combat the enormous wave of transforming robot toys, Hasbro created rub signs. These little stickers would reveal the Autobot or Decepticon logo when you rubbed on them, meaning that kids could now tell which were actually Transformers and which were store brand. Though we don't normally get rub signs anymore, since Transformers isn't really in competition with any other transforming robot toy, Hasbro will still occasionally bring them back as a gimmick for a toy line. For example, the Reveal the Shield toy line in the early 2010s. Transformers will return after these messages. Hmm, genius. Hi, I'm Michael Bay, director of Hollywood hits such as Transformers. And I demand things to be awesome. Awesome pussycat. Awesome house, awesome yard. Awesome barbecue, awesome pool. That's why I'm getting Verizon files. With the awesomeness upload and download speeds, isn't that right, awesome Verizon guy? Yes, sir. It blows cable away. And you know what the word for that is? Uh, awesome? Bingo. Introducing upload speeds over 1,000% faster than cable. Come on, I got something cool to blow up in the back here. Let's go. Come on. Yes, sir. This is fiber optic straight to your door. This is BIOS. This is big. We now return to the Transformers. In the Fall of Cybertron mission, Eye of the Storm, you can find a pin-up portrait of RC. So I guess Cybertronians do experience some kind of lusts. Or wait, is this like an art thing? Like you're supposed to go to like an art museum on Cybertron and just stare at that and be like, wow, that's really well painted. Transformers Beast Wars Diorama Story was a series of video shorts packaged with Beast Wars Telemaka figures. This short series starts off as a retelling of scenes from the Beast Wars cartoon, but by the end of it turns into a crossover between Beast Wars and the first live-action film. Though saying this diagram as a story is a bit of a stretch, since it's literally just still shots with the occasional laser or explosion sound effect added in. Regardless, Takara confirmed this series is canon to the Japanese G1 continuity, which is very strange. There was a massive Transformers statue being made called Superior Optimus Prime in the 2010s, that was described as the ultimate combination between Optimus the movies and G1. Basically a what if they combined kind of thing. Sadly, the statue was cancelled. Though at the same time, it's probably good it was scrapped because it would destroy people's wallets. Mine included. Street Fighter 2 X Transformers was a small crossover between the two franchises, released in celebration of Street Fighter's 30th anniversary. The lore behind this crossover is that Optimus, Hot Rod, and RC scan Ryu, Ken, and Chun-Li to take their appearances and fighting skills to battle Megatron, who scanned M. Bison for his appearance and fighting skills. It's one of the weirder ideas for a crossover. Bear Bricks are a Japanese collectible toy line that are usually designed after famous characters. And in order to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Transformers, they partnered with Takara to create six different figures based on Optimus Prime, Megatron, Starscream, Bumblebee, Nemesis Prime, and Optimus Prime from Age of Extinction. So a commentator in my last Transformers Iceberg brought up the Built to Rule toy line, and how they cut themselves trying to open a hotshot figure on one Christmas morning. Anyways, Built to Rule was the first Transformers building block line, and it was a complete and utter failure as it barely lasted a year. I didn't even know about these until it was mentioned in that one comment. Apparently, they were just really awkward to build, and they didn't really look right, and you couldn't really pose them, as unlike LEGO minifigures, these things didn't even have stud holes on the bottom of their feet, so they couldn't even theoretically be connected to a stand or something. So here's a little story. I'm doing a research for this video, and of course I'm using TF Wiki. And I see on the little side with like the go thing, a little robot. And I'm like, okay, sure, why not? So I click on it and it reveals this little robot scooter dude named Clutch. And it's like, oh, that's kind of funny looking. But, but then I notice something. His only lore is that he's a scooter-like robot that's carried by the Autobot Crosscut, who stores all his memories in Clutch. 
So if Crosscut was ever captured or killed, Clutch can return with all the Crosscut's information. Imagine you get a Razor Scooter, you know, the ones that destroy your ankles, and you decide one day, I'm going to put all my memories into this. Transformers in 3D was an extremely short-lived comic series released from 1987 to 1988, only lasting three issues. They don't really have any bit of continuity, as they don't really fit with the G1 cartoon or Marvel comics, or really each other, so every issue is kind of its own continuity. There's also some weird things in these stories that aren't in any other Transformers media. Like, for example, in the first issue, Hot Rod makes a comment that Rodimus Prime will show up if there's trouble. Like how in Spider-Man comics, like Peter Parker will act like Spider-Man somebody else. Is Rodimus Prime Hot Rod's secret identity? Do the Autobots not know that Hot Rod and Rodimus are the same person? Anyways, like the title suggests, this comic was in 3D. Kinda. Also, the final issue was the beginning of a three-part story arc. But the series got cancelled, so I guess we're just never going to see the ending to this epic saga. Released for the Commodore 64 in 1985, the Transformers is the first ever Transformers game. Players control Optimus, Jazz, Howard, Mirage, or Bumblebee as you battle the Decepticons who have literally killed every Autobot in existence except those five. To make matters worse, the Decepticons also have robo-cloning, which means there's like a hundred sound waves, sky warps, etc. This game even saw a sequel a year later called The Transformers Battle to Save the Earth, where you play as Clipjumper, Hound, Pipes, Cup, Bumblebee, Blur, Rodimus Prime, or Hot Rod. Yes, I said Rodimus or Hot Rod. For whatever reason, in this microcontinuity, Rodimus and Hot Rod are two different people. And these Autobots also battle robot dinosaurs, Decepticon Seekers, and a giant Hippopotamus. No, seriously, the Decepticons enlarge a hippo to kaiju proportions in order to defeat the Autobots. This is one of the best microcontinuities out there. Similar to the GoBots, Machine Robo was another one of Transformers' biggest competitors. Originally exclusive to Japan, Machine Robos were exported to North America by Tonka in order to become the GoBots. However, in Japan, Machine Robo was given two different animes called Machine Robo Revenge of Kronos and Machine Robo Battle Hackers. The first aired between 1986 and 1987, while the latter aired throughout 1987. Strangely, these shows never were officially released to the West, so only 15 episodes of Revenge of Kronos actually exist with official English subtitles, which isn't even half the show's length at 47 episodes. I'm sure there's fan subs out there though, so if you're interested, I'm sure you can find those. Sadly for Machine Robo, it was never as popular as Transformers in Japan, so eventually the franchise died out along with the GoBots in North America, until in 2015 when the franchise was relaunched. Wreckage was a Decepticon scrapped for the first live-action film. He turned into a striker and was cut out of the film pretty late into development, as while there's no CG model for him, at least released publicly, his figure for the film was marketed just as much as every other character in the film, so many were confused as to why he didn't show up in the film. Eventually, an end-universe explanation was given as to why Wreckage wasn't in the film. As before the film, Wreckage was captured by Sector 7, but revived shortly after the first film, only to be killed by Starscream, who claimed Wreckage had committed treason. Wreckage would have actually killed Starscream in their little fights if it wasn't for Bumblebee who showed up and shot off Wreckage's hand. Wreckage wouldn't be heard from again until 2014, when for some really weird reason, he appeared as a support character in the DS version of Rise of the Dark Spark. Back in 2007 and 2009, when the first two live-action films were released, fans speculated that each of these films contained secret Transformer characters. Now what do I mean by that? Well first, in the 2007 film's toy line, there were two figures of note, Longarm and Landmine. As for Longarm, his vehicle form is based on the tow truck Michaela uses during the first movie to carry an injured Bumblebee throughout the battle. People speculated that this tow truck in the film was actually Longarm in disguise. This theory got backed up when a figure of Longarm was released that came with an injured Bumblebee. Well, two figures. Well, two figures. One where he can transform, and the other where he can't. As for Landmine, his vehicle mode was based on the assault buggy seen during the final battle. Specifically, Buggy 52 which is actually seen in the first movie. Now, is there any truth to these theories? Yes and no. Technically, no, they're not in the movie. But in tie-in comics from IDW and toy bios, it's revealed that when Sam dropped the yellow spark during the battle, Landmine and Longarm were both created. So yes, technically that Toad Trek and that Buggy are those characters, they just weren't created yet. 
Landmine wouldn't be seen in any real story stuff, though Longarm would appear in one of the Dark and the Moon prequel comics, where he gets killed by Shockwave. As for Revenge of the Fallen, many people speculated that the plane that Optimus jumps out of at the beginning of the movie is actually Stratosphere. The only real evidence for this is that the Stratosphere's figure comes with an extremely tiny Optimus Prime figure that can be stored in his vehicle form. Outside of this, there's no actual story evidence to say that they're the same. In 2017, an exclusive Optimus Prime figure is released at Hascon 2017. This figure was a crossover between Hasbro and Chinese consumer electronics company Xiaomi. Basically, it's a Transformers figure that turns into a working power bank that supports up to 6,500 mAh of battery power. I don't know what mAh means, but I'm going to assume that means it's a lot of power. General Optimus Prime was an unreleased Generation 2 figure that would have had Optimus Prime ditch his classic truck mode and color scheme for a green army camo dump truck. The idea behind the figure was so popular that eventually a BotCon 2015 exclusive figure based on this General Optimus Prime was released. But this time, he didn't turn into a dump truck. I can only assume that this is Optimus from a timeline where he doesn't become a Prime, but instead stays a regular soldier. But yet again, he's still called Optimus Prime, so... Never mind, I guess. So everyone loves Trypticon, right? I mean, he's literally just a robot Godzilla. We've never seen that before. Well, okay, but he can transform. Okay, so it's not the most unique idea, but he's pretty cool. Now, for all the Trypticon fans out there, let's see if you're a real one. Here's a picture of two characters. What are their names? What's that? You don't see a second character. Well, here he is. Yeah, it's become forgotten time. But Trypticon's chest is actually a separate character named Full Tilt. He turns into a car that connects the Trypticon's chest to provide more firepower, and outside of Beast Wars Uprising and Transformers Legends, he's received practically no role in any story, despite technically appearing in quite a lot of comics. At least major story appearances. Even in the original IDW continuity, where he had only one cameo appearance early on, it was never connected to Trypticon. With every modern incarnation of Trypticon not having full tilt, it seems this poor little dude is doomed to remain one of the most obscure characters despite technically appearing in a lot of old G1 stuff. So Junkeep is a weird character, because technically he's supposed to be one robot created by KSI that splits into three different robots, but then sometimes he's just one dude and there's like five different Junkeeps that aren't related to KSI and they all land on Earth between Age of Extinction and the last night. I, so, it, it, so is it like they're created by man or are they naturally? I don't know. I don't care. Let's be real here. No one involved in production cared. Anyways, when it came time for Junk Heap to receive a figure in 2014, Hasbro considered using stinky plastic to create his figure as he turns into a garbage truck. The idea never went through and was vetoed for cost reasons. Now, I have no idea what stinky plastic is. Were they going to make him smell like garbage? Like, like, imagine you get this dude on Christmas morning, and when you open him up, the room smells like the team and T's hideout. Like, that's a terrible idea. My favorite number is 7. 7-Eleven, seven bitch! In 2018, Optimus Prime decided to help out humanity, not by fighting evil, but working for 7-Eleven, where he just transports stock to the gas station. But yeah, in 2018, Japanese 7-Elevens received 7-Eleven Optimus Prime figures you could buy. Why can't we get fun stuff like this in the States? It also comes with a 7-Eleven Matrix to light our darkest hour, I guess, and a Spike Quick Wiki figure in a 7-Eleven uniform. You'd think helping save the world a bunch would, like, make it so that you don't need to have a job, but uh, I, I guess not. I guess not. The Primus Vanguard is a team of seven orders made up of warriors from different dimensions. There's the Blue Order, which represents water, the White Order, which represents ice, the Green Order, which represents nature, the Red Order representing Fire, the Yellow Order representing Light, the Black Order representing Shadow, and the Purple Order, which represents Evil. They're led by Primus, who watches over them in the Ivory Towers. And you're probably thinking to yourself now, I've heard this before. And yeah, you have. It's basically a Transformers version of the Lantern Corps from the DC, only it's a lot more complicated since every single order is from a different dimension, and they represent elements instead of, like, willpower and stuff. Their story was told in the Generation Select special comic tie-ins, 
in which Optimus and Galvatron are sent on an adventure through time and space in promotion for the Generation Selects toy line. Each order has their own leader, and each leader has their own matrix. And they even have toys based on them. As for more story information about them, you're gonna have to do your own research because it's really confusing. Web Wars was a promotional game for Dark of the Moon, where a plug-in would be installed on your computer. Why? Well, by doing that, you can now battle Autobots or Decepticons on popular websites like Wikipedia, Facebook, MSN, etc. And with each website came its own specific weapons to collect. Imagine you forget to uninstall this, and you're doing research for a paper, and then suddenly Optimus Prime shows up out of nowhere on screen and starts shooting at you. Sergeant Frog X Transformers, I'm not pronouncing the Japanese name, leave me alone, is a one-shot manga crossover between the live-action Transformers films and the manga series Sergeant Frog. It involves Star Scream of all characters being summoned to another dimension where he gets his energy sucked out of him by a dude named Kiraro, who then proceeds to turn into Kiraro Scream. There is even a toy based on this Kiraro Scream, and I have no idea what any of this is. A Bathing Ape is a Japanese fashion brand with several stores across the country. And for whatever reason, they've partnered with Takara several times to produce multiple Optimus Prime figures for them over the years. I guess in whatever continuity this Optimus comes from, he just decided to retire from the war and became a model for a bathing ape. Transformers Beast Wars Ramune was a line of candy that came with small figures based on Beast Wars, Beast Wars 2, and Beast Wars Neo characters. It was only released in Japan, which explains the Beast Wars 2 and Beast Wars Neo characters, and it was this fizzy candy with quite a lot of figures released for it. Dual Fight Transformers Beast Wars Beast Warrior's Strongest Decisive Battle, just a name that rolls off the tongue, was a fighting game released for the Game Boy Color exclusively in Japan in 1999. In the game, you play as chibi versions of characters from all three of the Beast Wars cartoons that were released in Japan, so no Beast Machines. The characters in the game, being Transformers, can also transform, which means that each character has different attacks depending on which mode they're in meaning that the playable roster in the game is doubled. And the game features finishers like Mortal Kombat or Soul Calibur, but are obviously not nearly as brutal as those. Finally, the game also features a connection with Beast Wars Transmetals, that Beast Wars fighting game I mentioned earlier. If you inserted the game into the Nintendo 64 transfer pack, it'd unlock Megatron X, a character in Beast Wars Transmetals. No, not that Megatron X. This one. He's a game-exclusive character and is made up of crystallized Energon. The Secret Transformers Autobot Rescue Squad, aka STARS, was a Transformers fan club package. Kids could harass their parents into joining the organization to keep watch for potential Decepticon attacks. The package included a tech spec manual, an IRON patch, a STARS membership card, and a large cardboard playset called the Transformers Command Center. The story of STARS was told in mail-in flyers to the members, and in order to get all this, you needed to pay $6.50. Oh yeah, and in the Stars continuity, Stars was so successful that the Decepticons decided to create their own version of it, where they enslaved children with Deceptopacks. But they were all defeated by the Stars agents. Wait, that means both the Autobots and Decepticons were using child soldiers. And there was a Transformers child war going on. Transformers Metro based a Chinese exclusive section of Universal Studios in Beijing. It's based exclusively on the live-action films, which are extremely popular over there. They got a bunch of things to do there, like the Decepticoaster, Battle for the Allspark, Bumblebee Boogie, and of course, the 3D ride I talked about way earlier in the video. They also have some restaurants, and because it's a Transformers thing, there's shops there as well. Henry Orenstein is the man credited by Hasbro as the catalyst for Transformers as he was the one that convinced Hasbro to bring Diaclone toys to the States and repackage them. Henry was born on October 13, 1923, and is still alive to this day. He spent World War II as a refugee after the Nazi invasion of Poland, and eventually found himself in five different concentration camps. In these camps, he registered for a special squad of Jewish scientists and mathematicians called the Commando, with a K. He wasn't the scientist, in fact he only did this because he assumed that the Nazis would let him live a little bit longer. The Commando's goal was to develop a type of chemical weapon that could paralyze tanks. This project was thought up by Heinrich Himmler himself. Thankfully, Henry survived the war and went on to help create Transformers. He also created the whole card camera so that audiences could see players' cards when watching poker on TV. Now, with all that being said, he did have an involvement with the creation of Transformers. But as I said, he just convinced Hasbro to bring the toys over. He wasn't 
actually the creator, which is something a lot of articles mistakenly claim. He did create the rope signs, though, so that's something. Inspired by the Transformers, McDonald's Changeables, aka the McRobots, were a series of toys given away with Happy Meals in the late 80s. The idea was that these robots were secretly disguising themselves to McDonald's food, presumably to study people or something? I like to think that they exist in the Transformers lore. They're just a really obscure sub-faction of the Decepticons, created by Shockwave to study how he would eat or something. Originally introduced in 1987, the Changeables were brought back in 1989, and finally for one more run in 1990. Our urgent mission on Earth is to stop the Munchoids stealing the Happy Meals. But how? Listen, guys, we break down into microbots to cross the galaxy, okay? Then instead of rematerializing big, let's duplicate ourselves. So that everyone gets one of us in their Happy Meal and we'll beat the Munchoids! Each week there'll be a different one of us in every McDonald's Happy Meal and the box will transform too. Good work, Fry. But hurry, prepare to transfer. <laughs> Since then, they've become extremely nostalgic to many people online, so much so that two new changeable figures were released in 2019. The Transformers will return after these messages. Somebody, quick! Get the good paper! It's too late! Don't feed your copy of cheap and rough paper. Double A is transforming paper. High performance, super smooth. Double A, double quality paper. See Transformers Dark of the Moon only in cinemas. We now return to the Transformers. And there we have it. I'm never going to talk about Transformers again. That's a lie. I I, I will. But uh, for as for like a part three, it's not happening. I refuse. If someone else want if someone else wants to make a part three, go ahead, have fun. That ain't me. That ain't for me. Anyways, yeah, I don't really have much else to say. I'm gonna try to get out. I'm gonna try to get the cryptozoology iceberg out this year. This year, it won't be out this year. Uh, this month. Um, at the at the very latest, it'll be like November first, second or third. But uh, I'm gonna try my damnedest to get it out this month but again i have another video i want to get out this month so we'll we'll see but yeah i hope you guys enjoyed uh leave a like if you if you liked it and uh i'm going to create a new twitter account uh for my like for, like, for the channel i'm still gonna keep the twitter account that's out right now but that's just like my personal one and uh i retweet shit there constantly so you know if, if you want to be updated for like, the channel or see posts relating to the channel, et cetera, et cetera, or po even posts from me that's, you know, you don't want to be bogged down with like a million different memes and st Star Wars stuff, whatever, that I retweet constantly, uh, that it, you should follow that. I'll leave a, when it, when it's created, I'll leave a link to it in uh, the description. Uh, with that all being said, I hope you enjoyed and have a great one.